Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Can you hear me? Wave who are on. Fantastic. It's great to see um, all of you joining us. I'm Lori Malloy, the Executive Director at North Penn Legal Services. It's great to see uh, some of our staff on screen um, and some of our great pro bono attorneys uh, joining us as well um, from uh, your offices, your homes, and your exotic locations, uh, some of you. So um, uh, there's so much uh, to go over today. Um, and I'm gonna let uh, Tim introduce um, um, how we're conducting today's um, uh, webinar. Um, we're actually uh, working to get our license as an uh, online CLE provider. So today's um, session is an experiment. We can't offer you CLE credit today, but we hope we will in the future. I wanna thank um, our presenters before we get started. Um, they've worked really hard um, as you all know, there have been some updates as of September 1st um, with a new CDC order uh, in addition to um, what we've expected, um, a dramatic increase in filing of eviction actions. So um, our staff are going to review that. I wanna particularly thank um, Stephen Fernando, uh, Sarah Andrew and John Bird, um, attorneys um, respectively in our uh, Scranton, uh, Bethlehem, and Pittston offices for putting together the slides and the PowerPoints uh, for this presentation. Um, Tim, I'm going to let you uh, take it away and introduce uh, what the format will be. As you noted, when the call started, um, we are recording this webinar, um, and, um, and if you prefer not to be on screen, you certainly may go to um, the your your view um, and um, click on the three little dots and remove yourself from view uh, or hide your video if you prefer. Um, but it's also nice to have an audience. Um, so thank you for all those who are on screen and the 54 participants who are joining us at this time. Um, if you have a, a question you want to raise in the chat, um, we'll see if there is a moment where we can take a pause to um, uh, get those questions in the appropriate time. Tim, go ahead. Thank you so much. Tim has uh, worked really hard to organize this, and I thank Tim Smith, um, our Deputy Director for Operations, for putting this together for us. Thanks, Lori. Um, so I, I, well, I didn't really do too much. It was really Stephen and Sarah and John, but um, so I, uh, as Lori said, we are um, recording. Um, and uh, the, the presentation today um, will be, uh, we'll start off with Stephen and then um, Sarah and John will give us information. Um, as part of the CLE requ uh, requirements, we have to show that we're able to keep, um, or keep track of people who are participating along the way. And so to do that, we'll be um, pausing a, a, a couple of points through the presentation to ask uh, that you answer a kind of a, a an attention poll question, um, really just are you still there? Or are you there um, to uh, to show that we have that capability to the CLE board? Um, so we invite you to answer those poll questions when they come up. Um, during those times, we'll also be able to take some questions, and uh, the presenters will uh, re respond to those questions. Um, we would ask that if you do have a question, um, that you just type it into the chat, and, and I'll monitor that. And as uh, uh, as there's natural breaks in the presentations, you know, I'll um, interrupt and, and let the presenters know that those questions are there. Um, and then, um, kind of at the end of each person's uh, portion, um, there'll be a time for uh, some of those questions as well. Uh, so with that, um, we welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. And uh, I'll turn the time over now to Stephen. All right, thank you, Tim. I'm gonna try to share my screen. Um, okay, I don't know if you can see that, uh, there we go. All right, so um, this presentation is entitled Updates on Representing Tenants Facing Eviction During a Pandemic. Um, it was a lot of fun putting it together with Sarah and John and Tim. Um, I think a lot of the information in here is, is obviously very relevant. Um, there's, I've updated it as of yesterday with some new information. Um, but let's just hop right in because there's a, a large breadth of stuff we have to discuss. So today's agenda. 
I'm just going to introduce the eviction process for context, um, and then we'll go into the CDC moratorium. Um, after that, Sarah will discuss some FHA protections, and John's going to conclude with the rent relief program. All right, move this over. All right. So just to, for context, just a brief overview of the eviction process in Pennsylvania. Um, we've done many trainings and there's a lot of material out there on it. So I'm not gonna spend time on this. We'd like to get to the updates portion and, and the more relevant material. But generally speaking in Pennsylvania, if there's a landlord tenant relationship, then the landlord tenant act applies, right? So that means if you are a renter, the landlord has to file an eviction against you at the magistrate level. That's the process and they have to follow the procedure delineated in the Landlord Tenant Act to do that. Okay. Win or lose uh, or whoever loses has the opportunity to then appeal that to the Common Pleas Court. Okay, and then obviously further if there's further error. Um, but that is all in all the, the eviction process in Pennsylvania. So that's what we're going to be discussing. New laws that apply to this uh, process. So um, as many of you know, uh, announced on September 1st, uh, but in effect on September 4th, which was just last Friday, um, I guess about four or five days ago, um, the CDC issued an extraordinary and unprecedented, um, a very uh, monumental moratorium on evictions. Okay, so what that means is at the moment, for a large portion of tenants, uh, there is a moratorium that they cannot be evicted full stop. So it's, it, if applied, right, equally across the board and to the whole country, this is really just a life-saving measure. Okay, it's very important. Um, the Center for Disease Control is issuing this eviction moratorium to protect the public health. Okay, so I wanted to just hop right in and show you some, um, the actual text, okay, in the Federal Register. Hopefully everybody could see that too. Um, this is the document, this is the CDC order. It's the temporary halt in residential evictions to prevent the further spread of COVID-19. Um, interestingly, if you look over here on the document details to the right, some useful information, it shows that it was published on September 4th and its effective date is also September 4th, okay? Um, the citation's also here, which is really good if you're gonna be citing it or, or using it in argument or something like that, uh, that's what you can reference. Um, and you know, I, admittedly, I don't have a lot of experience reading uh, CDC orders or, or um, regulations like this, but this reads very easily. It's actually very interesting. Um, and they cite a lot of the health concerns uh, that they relied on in enacting this. So again, just to provide context and, and to give you a full picture of what this is and why. Um, it was issued under the authority of 42 U.S.C. 264 and a regulation pursuant to that, which is 42 CFR 70.2. I thought it was very interesting, um, so I also have the full text here. Um, so this uh, is the language of the, the law that allows the director of the CDC to basically take um, any action he deems appropriate to prevent the spread of serious communicable diseases. Right, so obviously uh, we're under a pandemic. So uh, the language in the register references some concerns with homelessness um, and the rising cost of housing. And they said if while well, evictions occurred, then homelessness would take place and COVID would spread. So that is how he created this new, again, monumental law. Okay. Um, and again, the rising cost of housing is also cited in, in the, um, the actual order, which is something I've seen personally. I mean, uh, a lot of my clients have reported to me that there's nowhere else to go. Um, and I've heard it so much, in fact, that I've been looking like on Zillow and Truly and stuff like that for um, uh, places if I was in their situation, if I had a family, right? Um, and the rising cost of housing of private rentals, uh, especially in the Scranton area, and Luzerne County is, is extraordinary. Um, so I do believe if this wasn't put into effect, lots of people, lots of families would really be homeless. So it is important. So this is the moratorium. Um, it applies wherever there is not a more protective state moratorium in effect. Okay. Um, ours in Pennsylvania expired August 31st. <clears throat> and I'm just going to show you quickly. 
go to the next tab. This is a uh, chart that somebody prepared. Uh, it's available online. I'm going to share all these links with Tim to send out afterwards. But this shows um, on the left the states, what state moratorium they have, if any, and whether the CDC declaration applies to them. So again, we can scroll down to Pennsylvania quickly in the bottom left here. You'll see Pennsylvania expired August 31st. And because it expired, uh, very simply, the CDC order applies to all of these different situations. Okay. Um, notably here, just interestingly, that American Samoa is mentioned um, in the order because they had no COVID cases listed in America Samoa. Um, the order doesn't apply to them. Just an interesting fact. Um, Okay. So again, this moratorium is going to apply to all tenants who present a signed declaration to their landlord. It seems to apply to all kinds of housing, including mobile homes, but explicitly not hotels or temporary lodging. Um, it lasts through December 31st right now, uh, which we'll talk about later, and there are criminal penalties for violations, which we'll also talk about later. All right. So the moratorium requires a declaration. So it requires an affirmative action by the tenant. Oh, I think I skipped one here, sorry. Coverages and exceptions to the moratorium, which is very important, so I don't want to skip it. So it only applies to non-payment of rent cases. Uh, and the exceptions are specific and enumerated in the order. So it won't apply to criminal activity being conducted on the property, threatening activity that threatens the health or safety of other residents, damaging or posing an immediate and significant risk of damage to the property, violating applicable building codes, health ordinances, or other regulations related to health and safety, and violating any contractual obligation other than the timely payment of rent, late fees, penalties, um, or interest. Okay, so those are the only ones that the CDC moratorium says it doesn't apply to. So I put at the end there, no, it doesn't say anything about the end of the lease term, right? So situations where your lease is expired, right? Or maybe you have a month to month lease. Um, maybe it's a little bit of a question mark about whether this moratorium applies to them. The argument would be because they did not enumerate that in their specific exceptions, that this moratorium also applies to end of lease term cases. Okay. All right, so as I said, the, the moratorium requires an affirmative action by the tenant uh, to file a declaration. So it requires the tenant to sign a declaration and provide it to the landlord. Um, I'm going to read them off because it's, it's again enumerated but very specific what the tenant has to say in that declaration. All right, the first one is that the tenant has to have used best efforts to obtain all available government assistance, rent or housing, expect to earn no more than 99000 annually, or 198,000 jointly, or were not required to report income in 2019, or receive economic impact payment. So at North Penn, that's all of our clients. Are unable to pay rent in full or make full housing payments due to loss of household income, loss of compensable hours or work or wages, uh, layoffs, or extraordinary out-of-pocket medical costs. Are making their best efforts to make timely partial payments as close to the full rental housing payment as possible would likely become homeless, need to live in a shelter, or need to move in with another person, uh, basically because they have no other housing options. Number six, understand they will still need to pay rent at the end of the moratorium. And number seven, understand that the, any false or misleading statements may result in criminal and civil action. Okay, so that declaration, many people have prepared um, a sample of it. I have one here. Uh, it's been translated to several different languages here at North Penn. We have one in Spanish already, which is great, and we could provide that to the uh, attendee. But this is the um, a, another sample one. Like I said, the declaration has a nice paragraph here explaining, right, what it is, and, and that also helps the landlord too. Um, and then it certifies those seven or so things under penalty of perjury. Okay, and then simply they can sign and date it. Right. Um, we'll go into some of these more specifically, some of the issues with these declarations and assertions, but this is a sample of it. Here also, oh, not that one, sorry. There are many tech companies, law schools, things like that, that have um, platforms for 
tenants to go online and fill out this declaration themselves. This is one here, um, again, I'll provide the link, but it allows an individual, say in Pennsylvania, to click through um, and ask them specific questions about the requirements we just discussed, and then allows them to create the declaration in an electronic format, even electronically sign it. Okay. Um, some of these, uh, and I've been playing around with them, um, you need to be careful about, they're not perfect. Some require financial disclosures or, or ask you how much you make, and they put that in the declaration themselves. So that's probably information that's excessive and we don't want the landlords to see, obviously. Um, so before sending an individual client or something like that to one of these websites, just make sure you go through it yourself. Um, but they could be a very useful tool to get these prepared quickly. And, that, and that's really the issue here is getting the word out about the decla declarations and getting them prepared. So in practice, um, how do we advise clients? Obviously, like we said, provide them with the declaration and advise them to sign it, if truthfully, um, and as soon as possible. The order says it's effective when it's provided to the landlord. So the next part of advice is to give it to the landlord immediately. Um, and you should maintain copies because if an eviction is filed, this, uh, the form that you provided to the landlord will be a defense mechanism at the magistrate level. You can say, I did provide this, so the moratorium should have applied to me. I also think it's really important um, that you advise the clients that they're still responsible for rent, right? This doesn't waive the requirement to pay rent. In fact, the opposite, it requires that you pay as much as possible uh, towards your rent. Um, so come December 31st, that amount becomes due. Um, so rent relief may be tied to this. It's not right now, um, but as of right now, they still need to pay rent. Okay. Um, if there's already an action filed, right? Uh, you should still prepare it and provide it to the landlord. Um, and remember that it's criminally enforceable by the landlord if they pursue that eviction further. Um, and really, if, with all these things, we need to work with the courts to iron out specific procedures. I wrote here in Lackawanna County, there's been instruction from the court admin to have hearings on the veracity of these declarations, right? Um, which isn't accounted for in the order. It doesn't say you have to do that. Um, so what's going to happen is our magistrates are going to see these declarations and ask clients, again, under oath and penalty of perjury, whether all of this is true. Um, so we should probably argue against that. Um, you're going to have to work with your individual courts. Uh, Luzerne County, on the other hand, issued an order instructing its magistrates to, well, they really just outlined the requirements of the CDC order and affirmed it. Um, so that's better, I think, than requiring hearings on the petitions. But how these things are going to get played out um, it is really up in the air. Again, this just came into effect five days ago. Um, so I don't Even think we've yeah. There, there is a question, a couple of questions. Um, the, uh, does the CDC moratorium apply if the landlords filed for eviction um, after the Pennsylvania moratorium and before the CDC moratorium began? So between 9-1 and 9-3. So that's a good question. And, and I definitely think it does. Okay. And I'm looking for the language of how the CDC defines eviction. Um, so it, it, they do define eviction broadly. Um, it, it seems that it will apply again after the action has been filed, right? So even if the action has been filed in February or March or something like that, and somehow the magistrates held that in abeyance, it'll still apply. Uh, similarly, if it's been filed before, in between the end of our moratorium, September 1st to September 4th, which I have some clients that's happened, uh, I think the best advice uh, is that the CDC moratorium applies. Um, keep copies of this declaration, give it to the landlord, ask them to cancel the proceedings immediately, and then keep a copy to present at the magistrate if you have to, um, or give it to the magistrate immediately. Um, what were the other questions, Tim? Sorry, I'm not sure if I could see it. Um, so one question was, um, do they still conduct a hearing if the landlord wants to dispute the declaration? And then the other question was, um, if you should also send a copy of this declaration to the MDJ if the action's already been scheduled? I think that makes sense. I don't know why not. Um, to, well, the second part first, to send it to the magistrate. I've been telling people, um, keep as many copies as you can, three copies or so, one for yourself, one for the landlord, one for the magistrate. 
give it to the magistrate if there's a pending action immediately. My concern, if you don't do that, is it might fall through the cracks, right? They may move forward without you or something like that. So just in an effort to cover all your bases, um, provide it to the magistrate. Um, and then um, does it apply if they've already ruled against the tenant for, in, uh, for non-rent related uh, reasons and the tenants filed an appeal and the appeal is pending? And again, I, I believe so. So the good part there is if the appeal is pending, uh, if they're paying bond or whatever portion of the bond they have to pay, um, they won't be kicked out and they can bring that argument to the common pleas court, which is good. Um, but it seems to apply to every stage in the eviction process, right? Not just pre-eviction, but uh, post-filing as well. Um, so we're doing with time here, but um, because it may not last, I also write here, you should continue to advise tenants on their other options, okay? Um, you know, John's gonna talk about rent relief, um, important, you know, proper withhold, rent withholding procedures, things like that, um, you know, continue to look for other uh, places if applicable um, to the point where it may not last, right? Uh, it seems like an action has been filed yesterday. Um, the first injunctive relief action that I could find in Georgia uh, regarding, it looks like a Virginia landlord where they're claiming loss of income because of this moratorium. So there's no injunction that's been granted yet, but they've filed that um, in Atlanta, Georgia. So. The problem here is everybody in America, landlords, tenants, states, governments has standing, right? So there's gonna be a flood of actions, injunctions filed against this. Um, so really we want people to take advantage of it now, if possible, because we don't know how long it's gonna be there. All right. In Pennsylvania, uh, the AOPC has issued a guidance memo on this. It largely affirms the, the moratorium language and its applicability to Pennsylvania, which is good. Um, but it seems to largely defer to individual courts to delineate these procedures, uh, like we discussed. So that's the problem. Uh, it does provide a declaration form, which is here. Uh, you can see it has the magistrate caption at the top. Um, so this seems to be more specifically where you need to bring it to the magistrate or provide it to the magistrate. But it has the same language or similar language in the actual affirmation. All right. So... It's just something I thought of, I don't know if it's helpful, but the order specifically defines criminal liability, right? So that is landlords in violation of this can face up to $100,000 fine or one year in jail or both. And that increases to $250,000 if the violation results in the death of a tenant, right? Um, and organizations, you can double that for them. So what I thought was if in negotiating or presenting it to a landlord, you nudge and remind them that the violations for this are not just criminal, but they're pretty serious, right? Especially if with the winter months coming, somebody ends up homeless and they die. You know, that's something you could remind the landlord of um, and just respecting these, uh, these declarations as they come in, okay? All right, probably spend a, a half hour or so on this slide, but questions and concerns that I have um, or that others have raised about the moratorium. Um, how will courts apply it, right? I think that's the big one. How do our magistrates view this and how what procedures are there? The timing requirements are unclear. It does seem, I mean, in providing the declaration, it doesn't say what happens after a judgment or whatever, but you should just advise people to provide the declaration as soon as possible. Uh, like we talked about briefly, there's a logical ap application for month to month leases or overstays, but it's not explicit. And AOPC isn't very clear on it either, I'd say. Um, uh, and that logical application being, you know, whether you can't pay your rent or whether you overstay your rent, being homeless has the same effect on COVID numbers or COVID applies to you equally, right? Um, it's unclear whether if provided at the magistrate level, the uh, hearing is stayed um, or if it's dismissed. I think we could obviously argue for dismissal. Um, Ongoing requirements for tenants to try to pay, <clears throat> have to use best efforts to obtain funds. Uh, many of my clients have not applied for rent relief or could not afford or could not for a variety of reasons. So uh, if the landlord can challenge on these grounds or those affirmations that you need to make in the declaration, um, I think a lot of tenants might get caught up on those 
right? Um, whether they've been paying as much as they could, whether they've looked for all the government assistance possible. Um, so just to note, some have brought up the need for right to counsel because if you're not advised of these things, you might not know some of these options. Um, there's a question about whether electronic forms and e-signatures are valid. Um, that might be a reason to pause on some of these uh, online preparation tools, um, but I think they probably will be valid in Pennsylvania. Um, and then, like I said, overstays. If you're making your payment faithful, faithfully and you have been over the past six months, uh, but nevertheless, your lease is up, it seems maybe you can't sign that declaration saying you cannot, you're not able to pay. Um, so those people may be able to be evicted and not be able to sign the declaration. Uh, I just have notes here. If there's multiple adults in one residence who has to sign the declaration, um, the order says all adults in the residence should sign it. But it seems that it'd be difficult to file an eviction against one adult. So one should be fine, um, but the order says all adults in the residence should. Um, and that's really all I have. Um, I imagine there's lots of questions. Um, not an expert on this. I've been reading a lot about it and, and obviously been keeping up on it uh, very closely over the past five days since it's been in effect or announced, I should say, on September 1st. Um, but with the challenges and everything coming, the biggest thing we can do right now is just get word of the declarations out there and help folks prepare them and get them to the public. Um, and I think we might have a poll coming up if there's any questions. Uh, Tim, can you launch that? Yep, so I've launched the poll. We'll keep it up for a couple of minutes. Um, so please respond. Um, there is one question. Um, does the tenant need to prove loss of income is due to the pandemic or can it be that the tenant made less this year than last year? And we could look at the specific language uh, required in the declaration. Uh, I believe it's pandemic tied, but that's a good question. Um, It says, I believe, in the AOPC guidance at least, uh, the tenants unable to pay the full rent due to loss of household income of poor work. Uh, so again, without refer cross-referencing the order, the AOPC guidance says just loss of household income or work. You may be able to craft a declaration uh, specifically to that. Okay, um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Sarah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I saw one of the earlier questions uh, on the chat was whether a, a district justice can conduct a hearing if the landlord wants to dispute a declaration that the um, tenant has made. And that was a question as to whether or not there had to be evidentiary hearings on the veracity of the declaration. Um, I don't know if there's a clear answer to that. Um, the declaration is an affidavit. It, it is to be taken at, at face value. Um, I think probably if the landlord requests an evidentiary hearing, it will be up to the magistrate to um, to allow that or not. Uh, and there's another, okay. So I think um, if you have more questions about the CDC declaration as we move ahead, go ahead and put them in the chat box and we'll go ahead and address them. Um, I'm gonna spend a few minutes on fair housing issues and um, the reason that we're talking about this is because, you know, the CDC declaration um, and every sort of preceding moratorium on evictions, uh, it applies when um, rent is owed and hasn't been paid. But there are other conditions and circumstances in which people might be um, facing eviction. And so we need to look at what other defenses there might be. And one defense could be that there are fair housing issues and the, um, the eviction might be a violation of someone's civil rights. So um, we're going to talk about the Fair Housing Act and some corollaries. And um, again, if you have any questions, go ahead and throw them in the chat box. So fair housing law all starts with the Fair Housing Act. It's a federal law. It was passed in 1968. It establishes the baseline for fair housing protections through all other statutes and regulations. In general, it prohibits this discrimination concerning anything having to do with housing, um, with a dwelling. Uh, that includes a sale, rental, financing, insurance, um, everything related to housing. Prohibits discrimination 
under those circumstances against people in specific protected classes. So if we skip on to the next slide, we're gonna show, Stephen, you're still in charge of that, right? Awesome. So these are the protected classes under the Fair Housing Act, um, sort of what you would expect it to be, oh, race, color, national origin, religion. Sex was added in 1974. Familial status and disability were two statuses um, or, or classes that were added in 1988. Age is not one in the federal statute, but in Pennsylvania, under the Pennsylvania Human Relations Act, age discrimination, um, which is defined as being 40 or older, uh, age is, is establishes protections. One thing that is missing from this list is LGBT protections and um, gender orientation protections. So if you wanna skip ahead, Stephen, there are some other circumstances where those protections are, are included. So there are two instances where um, there are additional federal protections where, that our clients are possibly gonna be protected by. One is the HUD's equal access rule. It applies to people who are in federally subsidized housing, such as public housing, Section 8 housing, or people whose housing is financed, um, financing is insured by HUD, or if there's an FHA insured mortgage, um, then the equal access rule applies. And this has all of, um, you know, all the other protections are still included under the Fair Housing Act. This adds equal access to HUD programs without regard to sexual orientation or gender identity or marital status. So that is, if that's what the uh, alleged um, discrimination is, there's protection under this rule. Stephen, if you wanna move ahead, the other federal protection is under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Um, this forbids organizations from excluding or denying individuals who have disabilities um, from an equal opportunity to receive, you know, all, all the same benefits um, uh, under uh, federal programs. It covers all HUD programs except for the mortgage insurance and loan guarantee programs. So this, again, is going to be Section 8 housing, um, public housing. All right. So... As I said, the Fair Housing Act establishes the baseline for protected classes um, and circumstances. There might be additional state protections. The Pennsylvania Human Relations Act, as I said, adds age as a protected class. There's also other guidance under there where handlers and trainers of support or guide animals are protected. Um, in addition to people who because of a disability have a, a support or guide animal, handlers and train, trainers of those animals are protected. It also protects tenants who are associated with individuals with disabilities. So that would be tenants who live with someone who, who has disabilities. And it gives some guidance on sex discrimination. Again, you'll see not on this list under the Pennsylvania Human Relations Act, it does not include um, LGBT protections, gender identity protections. However, local municipalities, might have those types of protections. So Allentown, Bethlehem, and Easton, where I practice, um, the cities have additional protections. Um, and so you might want to look where you are to see if, you know, just sort of keep dropping down, you might get protections at the local municipality that are not provided by the state or, or federal regulations or statutes. Okay, so those are all the protected classes. The Fair Housing Act applies when someone is in a protected class and the um, discrimination relates to a dwelling. So that is a, a term of art that's defined uh, in the Fair Housing Act and everything that's enumerated here is what constitutes a dwelling. So that's private, public and subsidized housing, manufactured homes, nursing homes, um, boarding houses, treatment facilities, dorms. Um, one thing I will add here, homeless shelters is listed as on a case by case basis. That is because um, not all homeless shelters, the, the main thing to consider is, is this place considered your home where you keep all of your belongings that you're going to be returning to uh, on a daily basis? If you're in a homeless shelter where you have to take everything with you when you leave in the morning and get back in line that day, then um, you know, where you might be denied shelter that, you know, on a daily basis, that is probably not gonna be covered as a dwelling under the Fair Housing Act, so you won't have protections from discrimination in that circumstance. Um, 
So this is where it applies. If you want to skip ahead there, Stephen. There are some dwellings that are exempt from the Fair Housing Act or Human Relations, uh, Pennsylvania Human Relations Act. So very few exemptions, basically buildings that have um, under the Fair Housing Act four or fewer units and it's an owner occupied building, then it is exempt. Pennsylvania under the Pennsylvania Human Relations Act is, is two or fewer units that are owner occupied. So if you have a, a two flat and the owner lives in one, then it's exempt. Um, single family housing that is sold or rented by the owner without the use of a broker, as long as the owner doesn't own more than three single family homes, um, then, the, then tenants who are facing discrimination from that, you know, home property, property owner are not protected under the Fair Housing Act. Um, housing that's operated by religious organizations or private clubs that have uh, membership criteria um, is exempt. That's a whole area of law. Hopefully we won't um, encounter that too, too often. And then senior housing is exempt if it complies with specific rules um, for communities of older adults. Generally what that means is that um, I think it's 80% of the units in like a senior housing complex have to actually be occupied by seniors in order for, for that um, complex to be exempt from, from uh, Fair Housing Act claims that um, where a family with younger children is, is uh, discriminated against or not allowed to live there um, based on their status, their, their familial status um, being a protected class. So basically senior housing can keep people out, can keep families out with children as long as 80% or more of the units are occupied by actual seniors. Otherwise, families are allowed to live there and it would be discrimination for them not to be able to live there. All right, you wanna move on? Thank you. Um, what is considered discrimination? You can kind of use your imagination here. Um, if it seems like discrimination, uh, very likely it may be, but some sort of specific things would be for someone to refuse to take an application for a rental or requiring different proof from people in a protected class than they would from, from people not in a protected class. Refusal to rent or sell, charging a higher rent, different terms, just in general treating someone differently um, based on their, their um, being in a protected class is considered discrimination. There are a billion examples of, of what discrimination could be. Next slide. Um, so when someone feels they're being discriminated against, what can they do about it? How do you enforce these, these laws and regulations? So step one, well, first of all, it kind of depends on the type of discrimination that someone is facing. Maybe, and we're gonna talk about landlords here in a, a rental context, just because of, of who our clients are and what we frequently um, see coming through our doors. First step is to negotiate with the landlord, if possible. You know, if it's really egregious discrimination and that's clearly not going to work, then you, know, you don't have to start with that. Um, but the first step is usually a negotiation. And then if the discrimination is not resolved, the next step would be to file an administrative complaint and, and um, people have several options here. So you can file a complaint with HUD. The link here on this slide um, will take you to the, the website where you can look at um, what a HUD complaint looks like. It's a pretty simple thing. They basically just want to know what happened, when did it happen, how were you impacted, who did this to you. It's like a five-page form. Um, you have one year to file a HUD complaint from the last date of the alleged discrimination. Um, if you file a HUD complaint, Within six months in Pennsylvania, generally it gets kicked back to the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission. You could, file, you could skip HUD and file directly with the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission if the discrimination is covered in Pennsylvania. That's a six month deadline to file from the last date of the discrimination. The city or local ordinances might have different statutes of limitations, or you could skip all of that and go right to the Justice Department and file a civil rights complaint. You have six months to do that. Now, I will say that oftentimes if someone will file a HUD complaint, it might be investigated and then the Justice Department may decide to prosecute based on the, the, the finding that there was discrimination. If someone files directly with the Justice Department, 
they might just kick it right back to HUD. So it is a little bit of a circular process. There are some circumstances where it makes more sense to file with the Justice Department first, and we'll get to that in a minute. And then finally, you can skip the administrative process and file a private lawsuit in state or federal court. The statute of limitations there is two years. Next slide. All right, just because we're, we're um, looking at the time, I'm not gonna go through the next two slides in incredible detail, but what I've done here is sort of break down um, by the protected class, sort of when it applies, what discrimination might look like. So one thing to keep in mind when the discrimination is based on race, color, or national origin um, is that it's recommended to file with, with HUD. The Department of Justice may investigate and bring suit or refer it back to HUD for investigation. But what needs to be shown here is either discriminor discriminatory intent or a discriminatory effect. Um, so even if there's no intention to discriminate based on race, but the effect of a policy does discriminate based on race, then that can um, be, be grounds for, for, a, for a claim. That is actually being looked at right now and changed. Um, there is a, a potential new rule on what does it mean, what does discriminatory effect mean. So that's a little bit in flux right now. Um, but for now, it still is what it is. If the um, discrimination is based on religion, that would apply to people who, you know, wear religious clothing or engage in certain rituals or clearly, um, you know, display religious symbols where you can really show that whatever is happening is based on the person's religion. In this case, it's better to file a HUD complaint first um, rather than going straight to the Department of Justice, because if there's no HUD complaint filed, then, um, then the Department of Justice can only bring its own suit if a pattern or practice of discrimination is alleged. So for an individual um, looking at their own circumstance, go to HUD first. Next slide. Um, sexual harassment is the one instance where it makes sense to um, file a claim with the Department of Justice first. Um, I, I think, before HUD. They have a special initiative going right now. Um, they're really focusing on targeting, targeting these instances of sexual harassment, which would be where uh, um, a landlord is pressuring a tenant for sexual contact in exchange for, um, you know, lowering the rent or in lieu of rent or, or, you know, making housing unavailable based on sex or gender. But if someone is facing sexual harassment by their landlord, um, go to the Department of Justice and file a claim there. There, And you can, um, th the link earlier to the DOJ has instructions on that. And then familial status, we did talk about a little bit. Um, this would be discrimination against a family that has children or um, one or more individuals who are under 18 years of age or of um, if the, if the clients are in the process of securing legal custody of a minor, which would include adoption or fostering, um, it's basically discrimination against people for having children in their family. Um, so what we do here is, and it applies to everyone who's providing housing. So you might see a situation where kids aren't allowed in a certain section of a apartment complex. There was a case in Allentown just last year where the complex had to pay $60,000 in fines for that exact circumstance. So these are followed up on, they are prosecuted. If you have a family that's being told they can't live here because they have children, um, it's worth following up with a HUD complaint. All right, next slide. We're gonna talk a little bit here about people with disabilities um, as a protected class because we see this Frequently, and this in particular is a circumstance where that I've seen during the pandemic. If people have a mental health disability or mental health issues, um, everyone is stressed. The pandemic has been really wild, and people who already are have issues might be experiencing more stress, more acting out, more disturbances. So um, this extra protections for people with disabilities is something to follow up with here. It is definitely worth looking into. Who's covered? People with physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities, is regarded as having such an impairment, or has a record. 
these people can make requests for changes if those changes are needed for them to have the full use and enjoyment of a property, which would include not being evicted from the property. And the change requested has to relate to the disability. Next slide. Sorry, I'm rushing through guys, but I wanna get through this. Um, the two things that people with disabilities can request would be a reasonable accommodation, which is a change, exception, or adjustment to a rule or a practice, such as there's some examples there, early termination of a lease for them to move, um, not being evicted, or they could ask for a reasonable modification, which is a structural change. An example here would be like a ramp or a stair glide. Frequently, we're dealing with reasonable accommodations to avoid eviction. Next slide. Um, so the individual has to establish a nexus, a connection between what they're asking for and their disability. Um, the request can be made at any time. It can be made at any time in the eviction process. And the request does not have to be in writing, but we certainly prefer it to be in writing. Um, it can be oral, but the preference is for someone to put down in writing, I am making this request because I have a disability. The housing provider can ask for medical documentation. Generally, that's just going to be a letter from a medical provider that says this person has disabilities and this would help them. They can't ask for a diagnosis. And this is the starting point for this process. Asking for the reasonable accommodation is the starting point. And then it is a negotiation with the landlord. If the landlord will not respond um, or denies the reasonable accommodation request, that's when you can look at filing a HUD complaint, but you start it by trying to work it out with the landlord. Next slide. Um, the landlord can deny a reasonable accommodation request if they face undue financial and administrative burdens for granting that request, or if it fundamentally alters their operations, or if the tenant poses a direct threat to people or property. So, um, Yep, we'll go ahead, we'll skip right ahead. Um, some examples, you can look at these yourself, but here's one, I'll leave you kind of with this. I've had cases where, actually skip to the next one, the next one's more relevant, Stephen. Individuals with behavioral problems that lead to disturbances, um, and then they get issued an eviction notice. So what you do in this case is you make a request for reasonable accommodation to the housing provider. You ask for the person to get some time to get themselves together, change their meds, see their doctor, get, get into therapy, and you're asking for the eviction to be held off while they get themselves together. That is the reasonable accommodation request. Get some sort of uh, medical evidence from a therapist or a doctor that says, yes, this person has a disability and more therapy would help them and time without being evicted would help them. And then, um, then basically the, the landlord should allow that to happen because if the behavioral issues can be resolved in this way, then any allegation of breach of the lease based on behavior can be cured. Um, so if you have any questions about this, um, there's another slide on people with, you know, service animals um, and then Violence Against Women Act. I want to give some time over to John Bird. You can always email me if you have any questions about fair housing stuff. Thanks. So we do have <clears throat> one uh, other poll. Um, so I'm going to start that now. Uh, and um, Sarah, while we're doing that, there is a one question um, related to uh, the definition of the word sex. Um, uh, parent, there's, what's the de what about the definition of sex that the Supreme Court just ruled upon for employment? Um, could it be used um, here by analogy? Probably not. I think that was pretty specific to employment. Um, it really depends on the circumstances. Again, there might be a local ordinance, like a city or, or a county um, ordinance that, that does, cover, um, does cover that if we're talking about gender stuff or LGBT rights, but, um, but sex is protected as far as sexual harassment and discrimination goes um, under the Fair Housing Act itself. So, but I would say, no, you really, you really can't um, correlate employment 
employment law with, with housing law is two different things. Okay. Um, and then another question going back to the CDC moratorium. Um, the question is about uh, substantial loss of income. Any guidance on what would be considered substantial loss of income? Um, I guess that's more for Stephen. It's a good question. And I don't think there is uh, like a number or a percentage or anything like that. Um, but again, it, it's meant to be broad, right? So if you make less than 99,000 a year um, and you can show loss of income and your inability to pay rent and your willingness to try to pay rent, I think it applies to you. So I, I don't think there's a percentage on it um, of what's substantial, but you know, just hopefully it applies broadly. That's how I'd interpret it now. Okay, I think that's the, the only questions. Um, so we'll turn time over to John. Awesome. Well, thank you both, Stephen and Sarah. That was uh, very informative. Um, looking at the CARES RRP is the Rental Relief Program, and it's one of two programs our state uh, is, is offering in order to try to keep people housed. I noticed that today's the ninth, so we are exactly three weeks away from the current cutoff of the RRP uh, application process. So um, both for RRP, which is the Rent Relief Program, and PMAP, which is the Mortgage Assistance Program, um, we have three weeks at the moment to spend quite a bit of money. Stephen, would you move to the next slide? Thank you. So we applied as a, as a state for 3.9 billion and the General Assembly set aside 175 million for housing. Um, majority of that goes to the RRP with only 25 million being set aside for mortgages. So I won't go through everything in its entirety, but the slides will be available. But what I wanna kind of point out are the highlights. So this only applies for rent that's occurred between March 1st of this year and December 30th of this year. And for a rental, you only get $750 a month uh, to be applied towards your rent. So if your rent is over 750 and there are other areas that you may apply for, for housing assistance, you want to apply for those first because once you make the application to PHFA, the landlord must certify that they are not going to accept funds from any other agency or from you or from anybody else or from the tenant. I guess you wouldn't probably be paying your tenant's rent um, for, to satisfy the money that's owed. Now, if you have a household that's more than one person, not a married couple. A married couple counts as one household. But if you have a couple people who are renting an apartment together, each person is eligible. So if the rent is over $750, they may be able to come up to $750 each, depending on how many people are in the household. Does that make sense? So if it's a four person household and the rent is two thousand, they may get they may they'll be able to pay the two thousand and be five hundred dollars a person. Um, another thing is, is that they have to be 30 days past due. So you can't file on September 30th. I had a question yesterday. Um, someone was going to, they had been paying their rent through um, savings and different things. At the end of September, there was no more money. They have lost their job for COVID and they cannot apply for the RRP because they will not have been 30 days behind at the end of um, the application, at the end of the application process. So one of the definitions they use are whether or not someone is unemployed, and they just use the standard unemployment definition. Um, Stephen, would you move on? Thank you. Now, uh, instead of just being unemployed, you could also have uh, a thirty percent drop in outcome in income. And one of the ways they calculate that is, and I'm not a mathematician, so I'm just gonna read this part and that's why there's no examples, um, but you double the 50% limit adjusted by household size and compared to current annualized income. And the website is above that to find the median income. And then the, el the client is not eligible if the annualized income is 100% of the median income amount. So um, I leave the calculations to you. Uh, next slide. 
So they do have to verify uh, through anybody who applies will be verified through labor and industries unemployment compensation system. If they do not show up in the system, there are other ways to verify, but everybody's getting run through that system first, just to determine whether or not they have been unemployed. Um, once verified though, you are assumed eligible for six months of payments. You do not need to continually verify. So if you were three months delinquent, and there you were verified and they're going to make a payment for those three months you could automatically request another three months worth of payment um, so that's a good thing and then our the necessary executed docs the landlord application a landlord property uh, certification and the lessee household certification when we went on the training from phfa we understood that that there would not be an inspection. Um, they just have to certify that the property is whatever the, the certification is required. Um, you know, these are just some FAQs, which I'll be honest with you, I stole right from the PHFA website. So I thought if they're gonna explain how they're administering it, what's the best way uh, there? So we could kind of skip through these, um, Stephen, just in the interest of time. Thank you. So I wanna say that now, this is from the press release from PHFA on August 15th. There has not been a new uh, press release since. So at the moment, remember we had 170, 150 million put aside um, less than a month ago. We only spent 500, less than 500,000. So one of our arguments is that if a, a tenant is, a, is being evicted for non-payment of rent, this was prior to the CDC. I understand, you know, everything kind of, takes a turn, but um, that they shouldn't be el eligible to be evicted as long as the landlord is eligible for the RRP funds because, you know, that if it's only for a non-payment of rent, then the landlord eventually gets paid. That should be how the game is played. Of course, you can't force anybody to enter, to enter into a contract with someone else, but um, that's kind of where we stand. Um, Steve, would you go on to the next one? So the pandemic, this is for the mortgage. This is a little bit, the timelines and everything for the mortgage assistance is the same. I think it becomes a little bit more tricky because you're probably not going to get a mortgage company to forgive uh, any balance. So um, Stephen, would you, thank you. Um, it only applies to first and second mortgages, not liens. So a mortgage can be a third uh, position based on a municipal lien, for example. So maybe you have a uh, municipal lien, a mortgage, and a HELOC, and even though it's third position, as long as it's a second mortgage, that's fine. Um, so the funds are paid as a grant, and the same way the RRP, you would qualify for up to six months. You only get $1,000 for um, the mortgage assistance. So if your mortgage is over that, then they have to agree to release any obligation for anything over $1,000. And I, I'll be honest with you, I think that's relatively unrealistic. Um, it doesn't hurt to ask, doesn't hurt to try, um, but it's a secured debt and I, I don't think they're gonna be releasing, um, but that's just me. So, and then you cannot uh, use the loans if you are in an active forbearance. So that's also important to know. Um, okay, Stephen. One of the things to help with is that it doesn't have to just be a regular mortgage. If you have a land installment, installment sales contract, um, they're able to help you with that. Anything that looks like it's home ownership and it has to be located within the Commonwealth. So um, we're good there. Now, um, homeowners must hold legal or equitable title in an effort to assist families with tangled titles and intergenerational family homes as well as applicants with installment sales contract or agreement, equitable owners who are not the sole record owner of mortgage uh, or mortgage or may be eligible. And I'm about to say, I see that a lot. I see a lot of people who come into the office and they say, I just inherited this home. There's a mortgage on there. Um, it was originally grandmother's home, then it passed to the aunt, and then now it's in me. And it, there's been no probate. Um, so no deed work has been done. And this person may own the home, but there's no deed work or title work that shows that they are the, the record owner. So those individuals also can apply for assistance. 
Um, there have been 1,619 applications for PMAP assistance. They have not given us a breakdown as the same with the RRP. Um, so uh, we don't know exactly what, what, how, how much money has been out there. So some of the problems, and I've been hearing from people who receive the applications, uh, I don't mean clients, I mean like the agencies who are administering the funds, they realize people don't have printers, so they can't do the application and send it in. So sometimes people are, some organizations are mailing applications or having people come in to help. Um, the rental limits are too low and they want the September uh, deadline to be extended. And the uh, PHFA website added a checklist for both applications. Um, so you can go online and make sure you're submitting all the right forms. I think um, people aren't hearing back and that's why people are getting nervous. It's been my understanding that if you're not hearing back, then you're probably okay. Um, but take that, you know, that's one county's organization, um, how they're working, because they said they're being slowed down by all their requests for updates on the status. Um, I do want to share with you, and I don't have a slide for it, um, the legislature is actually considering a bill that would fix some of the issues and hopefully go along with the lessons learned. So it's SB 1290. And what that would do is eliminate the requirement that tenants be 30 days delinquent. Um, and they would be able to apply as soon as they cannot meet the current month's rent. It would raise the maximum rental assistance from 750 to 130% of the HUD established reasonable fair market rate for a two bedroom apartment. Uh, it would raise the max maximum mortgage assistance from 1000 to 1500 and it would provide the landlords with the option of forgiving any balance owed in exchange for an extra sum from RRP, uh, the rental relief program, or entering into a payment agreement for the balance. It would provide the mortgage company this, pretty much the same thing. They would uh, forgive the balance in exchange for an extra sum from PMAP, or it would assess uh, the homeowner's eligibility for loss mitigation options, which is you know the type of streamlined modifications, things like that. Um, it would also, and I think most notably, extend the deadline for applying for assistance from September 30th to October 31st and give everybody another month to get the applications in. Um, I think that's actually one of the, the biggest things is, is that there was such a little bit amount of time for people to start applying and for these agencies to administer the funds. Um, it, it, the turnaround time was way too quick for it to be truly effective for uh, our clients. I believe, and I echo what I heard from Stephen earlier, that there's no place to go. So nobody's being evicted right now. So there's no apartments. There's no place for people to go once they lose the housing that they have. And that's a real challenge. Um, that's all that I have for you. I'm happy to answer any questions or probably go back to Stephen and Sarah because I think theirs was much more interesting. I don't see any questions in the chat at this point. Okay. Um, oh, Sheila is just letting us know that um, she's working at, for, for those here at North Penn, that she's working on a template to produce the CDC declaration form for clients. Um, either in the MDJ format or as a pre-court format. Um, and it can produce a declaration for one or two clients per household, um, Spanish as well. I will distribute a copy of that um, uh, to participants. Um, uh, it's a, a great, um, simple, can't engage with an interactive um, uh, link uh, that we'll also provide to you. Well, thank you so much to everybody for participating today in uh, this seminar. Uh, great job to all our presenters. Um, and thank you for all your engaging questions. Uh, there's so much more to learn and we'll schedule updates uh, accordingly. But uh, thank you to S Stephen, Sarah, and John um, for, for your updates and, and your thoughtful uh, preparation for today.